on the Newman Jets Audio Network. This is the JetCast, the official podcast of Newman University Athletics, featuring exclusive interviews with coaches, players, administrators, and more. The JetCast podcast is brought to you by South Central Ceiling and Paving, online at scsealing.com. Mel Hambledon Ford, Pepsi, Allstate Insurance Agent Mike Light, Eck Agency, Donlinger Construction, Big Corner Creative, Dr. Brennan Lucas and Advanced Orthopedic Associates, Keystone Solid Surfaces, and by Overland Charters, the official transportation provider of Newman University Athletics. Here's the voice of the Newman Jets, Blake Kreps. The Newman Jets men's soccer team is 2-3 after an impressive 5-1 victory over Harding at the Stryker Sports Complex in Great American Conference play last week. Now the Jets return to GAC action at Northeastern State on Saturday. Joining me to break it all down, the Dean of Coaches at Newman University, Cliff Brown. This is the JetCast episode number 38. Coach, welcome back to the show and congratulations on the win. Thank you, and I appreciate you inviting me here. Well, Coach, how different is this feeling right now normally i mean i don't know i, I honestly don't know what you normally do in the spring but uh normally I'm, I'm guessing that there's probably some time for rest and relaxation training this year is much much different you guys are playing in great american conference uh, matches right now how different does this feel to you leading your team and, and getting game action in at this time of the year when normally you're off well we're actually we're usually not off in the spring we have our our spring season which sure which is five playing dates, and we, we try to schedule two full games for each of those playing dates so we get ten games in. So that's what we do, and, and we train pretty much full-time as well once we're into that, that part of the season. So it's usually pretty busy. For coaches, to be honest, there's no off-season. <laughs> right. And uh, it's, just, it's just a different type of season. So we just th- – but you can't deny that it's completely different this year. We went for um, 15 months without a game. Okay. 13, 14, whatever, whatever, however many it was, without playing a single game. Most of these kids weren't able to play back home in, in their hometowns, where, whether it was domestic or overseas. So they came in in the fall. We were looking to play originally. And sure. Then, and then that got canceled. And then we just struggled through the season. We had a lot of injuries because people hadn't been doing things. And not having any competition, it was just very, very difficult. So this is very unusual. We're just happy to be up and running. Oh, uh, how, how hard was it to keep the guys just mentally focused? Because you were one of those false sports, obviously, mm-hmm. that was in that will they or won't they for, for all those summer months. And then obviously the edict finally came down that, no, you're not going to. And not only that, but there's not going to be any kind of an NCAA postseason this year. Now, you guys are playing regulation, Great American Conference games, so at least there's that. These games count in the standings. There's going to be a Great American Conference champion recognized at the end of the season. There's going to be a GAC postseason. So at least the soccer team does have that to look forward to from the Great American Conference, but no NCAA postseason this year. Um, how was that trying to navigate the guys through that big quagmire of questions that you had during the regular season back in 2020? Yeah, this is... It's been a total, like I said before, a totally different experience for everybody. But the guys have been very adaptable. They really worked hard. They're they're excited to be playing, to be honest. And no one's worried about whether there's a postseason past past the conference postseason. They're just excited that there is a, a GAC <laughs> tournament and, right. and GAC games. And we've tried to fill up. We're allowed to play up to 14 games. We couldn't get that many people to compete, and we've had some cancellations. But um, we're we're working hard to give them as much of a, an experience as we can. Three to nothing in the second half in your last victory over Harding. You won that match 5-1. to one. You outscored Harding. That was a GAC match. Played last Thursday. You outscored them 3 to nothing in that second half. What do you feel like triggered the difference for you in the second half that propelled your team to victory? Well, first off, Harding has been kind of a thorn in our side. Last year, they were the only team in the conference we didn't beat. And although we were tied with a record with them at the end of the season, they had us head-to-head, so they, they qualified for the postseason. So it was one that we really wanted to get back because we felt last year we should have beat them both times. So this time I think we just stuck a little bit better the system. I pushed Nacho up high, a little bit different position. When we, he played last year, he played out on the wing. And then uh, in the earlier games this year, he's been coming from the number 10, a deeper lion position. But we wanted to get him isolated with their, with their backs because they play three in the back, and we thought he could take care of that. And it, it really proved to be the case. But the, the key really was – 
that about six minute period, five, five, six minute period at the end of the first half and the beginning of the second half where we got three goals in a row where we pulled back. And both the first two goals came from long punts from JC, from our goalkeeper, uh, Jean-Claude Console. He read the situation, he saw Nacho was isolated one-on-one, -on -one, and Nacho did a fabulous job. In earlier games, he was, he's, he's an emotional, passionate player. <laughs> and you probably could see that when you interview him coming up next. He's, sure. Uh, he's, he's very excited about everything he does, and sometimes he gets a little over-emotional in the games. And, uh, this time he really controlled and he focused the motion, he, he channeled the right direction and he just burst through and then the second one was also long before the end of the first half from JC again. This time it was uh, Duarte Mendez who w challenged the defender and won it and it broke it loose and um, Nacho just stayed with it again. And then at the start of the second half, because those two goals came in the last five minutes, I looked at where the team was set up. Uh, Harding was set up on the kickoff. We had the kickoff. And I signaled to Nacho. I said, just go, just go. And he goes, what? I said, no, just go. <laughs> because the, the spacing was wrong and there were gaps. And I, I felt if he beat the first guy, he'd be one-on-one -on -one on, in, into the box. And he just burst through, just went straight through off the kickoff. I don't know, six seconds, 10 seconds into the second half, whatever it was, we got the penalty kick. And then we're up and rolling. Yeah. So, so that was really it. We just got that moment at that point and because Harding had been dangerous they scored the first goal and they could have scored the second goal they had a really good chance to score if that if they'd done that it might have been a little bit different game sure so, so it, we kind of rode that that way where I felt we were dominating the game but they were catching us on counterattacks, and that's something we have to really work on second half we had the wind in our face so I pulled the guys back to a deeper defensive line to not expose the, the space in behind where they could get in and to keep the lines compact between the lines because I felt we were too spread out in that first half. We were so excited going with the win and we, we, we opened up too many gaps. So we really focused on tightening up those spaces the second half and I think that did, did well for us. Coming up next on the show, you heard him talk about Nacho. It's Ignacio Larich from Argentina, a junior forward, leads the Jets in many offensive categories. He's coming up next, and then we'll also be joined by Emily Young from women's tennis from England. So a lot of international flair on this episode of the JetCast. I want to ask you again about Ignacio, the guy you call Nacho. He's got 15 of your team's 30 points and 14 of your 40 shots. So, I mean, obviously the guy is, the offense runs through Nacho for sure. What makes him such an important score for you guys in terms of getting the ball on goal and getting the ball into the goal? Well, there's some things you can't coach. And, <laughs> and what you can't coach is that attitude, that passion that he has that I spoke of before. You can coach him to control it, sure, but um, and direct it. But the biggest difference for us is we've pushed him up up high this year instead of out wide. I originally recruited him as a forward, but the way the team uh, developed those years, it worked better to play him as a wing. And this year, we just felt we wanted to get more central, where he's able to get into those because he's such a good one v one player. But he also can combine with other people. But the biggest thing, he's just powerful. He's a big, strong. He's got pace, and he can. You get him in those positions, he's going to score. Defensively, last time out was a big improvement. You gave up four goals against Fort Hayes State. The match before that was a one nothing loss to Roger State, so it's not like the defense hasn't played well at other times this year, but just judging from the Fort Hayes State game to Harding, what do you feel was the big biggest catalyst for your improvement defensively between those two matches? Yeah, we Actually, we, if you go back even to some of the, pre the earlier games where we kind of gave up some goals to McPherson. So we worked on tightening down the defense quite a bit right before the Roger State game. We, we spent a lot of time on our, our shape and our system, responsibilities of each player. And I thought the, the Roger State game, well, actually, to be fair, we played pretty well. And a draw would have been fair, and, and maybe we should have won the game, in my opinion. Uh -huh. um, we, didn't, we didn't take our chances well. We weren't clinical in front of goal. And so we've been working on our shooting a lot as well lately. <laughs> sure. But against, against Fort Hayes, the bottom line was we just made mistakes. Um, if you go back and watch that game, three of their goals were on set pieces. One was a penalty. We didn't defend them well. They were, they were silly fouls to give up in a game and just mistakes. And we didn't defend the set pieces well. So there are all things that are, if you focus and you do things right, you can eliminate those problems. And the Fort Hayes game, no excuses, but we started, we had 30 mile an hour wind in our face the first half. And it was very difficult, but we still, I thought, played some really good combination. Didn't get anything in the end out of it, but they weren't really dangerous other than when we gave up mistakes. We, it was kind of a no, nothing game at that point. 
Second half, we had the win, but it kind of died down. Sure. It wasn't nearly as strong, but we still had it. Like I said, it's not an excuse. But we we just kind of, I think, panicked a little bit and lost lost our way and, and gave up silly mistakes. FC Wichita, a U-20 friendly. So as fans are watching this or listening to this, you're going to already be in action probably at halftime or maybe even deep into the second half of that match as this is being posted. But you've mentioned that You've had a certain number of matches that you've been allowed to schedule this year, but because of all the restrictions, there are so many conferences, so many schools that have different restrictions in terms of, well, we can't play teams outside of our state or, you know, traveling. And so you've mentioned it's been difficult to, to fill all the games that you can. So you filled a couple with FC Wichita. The first one was postponed, if I recall correctly. Uh, the weather that week was not too favorable when you tried to play them the first time. In fact, that may have been during the deep, deep freeze here in Wichita, but a U-20 friendly coming up here as people are watching and listening to this podcast. What are you looking to get out of a match like that in the middle of the week before you head back into Great American Conference play coming up on Saturday? Yeah, it's, it, these games are actually really important because this is usually what we do in the spring. We, we'll play some club teams, we'll play some junior colleges, and I always play everybody equal time. I give gotcha. up everybody, and so th- this is a chance to develop players, and it's really important because this spring, it's different because we have real matches and some of these young players aren't getting the playing time that they, they need to develop at this time of year. So this is a great chance for these kids. This match, in terms of win-lose, it's not about that. This is about developing these kids, giving them the chance to play under pressure. And the FC Wichita team will also have some older players. Sure. Because this isn't bound by any rules. That <laughs> right. It's their U20. So they're bringing in some of my alums that have played in the FC oh, on, the, on, okay. on the senior team and some other players that are really top quality players. So it's going to be it's going to be an interesting match. It's not just going to be against a bunch of kids. Gotcha. So it'll be an eye-opener and uh, possibly a couple of former Jets returning to play their alma mater. So the final question for you is coming up next, you've got the Riverhawk of Northeastern State back in a great American conference play. If you're not aware, men's soccer is kind of a joint venture between the MIAA and Great American Conference. The two conferences made a trade, and so the MIAA administers a couple of sports that the Great American doesn't have quite enough teams for, and the Great American is administering men's soccer, which neither conference has quite enough teams for. So that's why we're not talking about MIAA men's soccer is because the Great American is administering the uh, the sport and the MIAA schools that play are playing in it and the Great American schools obviously they're in their own conference uh, but Northeastern State obviously is somebody that is in the MIAA and uh, a, a rival that all the Newman sports are dealing with right now and one that you're dealing with in the GAC so what do you expect to see out of the Riverhawks on the road at Tahlequah coming up on Saturday? Yeah they're always a very very good team they, they play Really nice football, soccer, sorry. Um, they, they, either is fine on this show, but for this show only. Yeah. This show only. <laughs> yeah, I get used to because all my internationals, we, we, we usually call it football. So, And that's how I was raised with it because I was coached by an English coach of all, course, my, of course. all my, my youth career. But anyway, they're a very talented team. We split with them last year. They beat us here. We beat them there. And the one thing about just one-off games this year, so it's a little bit more difficult. You don't have that chance to get something back. Oh, sure. So it's, I, I anticipate a very, very, very challenging game down there. Um, they, they play very tight defense. They're very difficult to penetrate. We scored a great goal from um, Victor, who, who moved on, and he's at, uh, down at Midwestern State now. He just broke through the team individually and, and put it away. But it was created by team effort and, and the runs off the ball and everything. But So it's going to be a very, very difficult game. But I think, like us, they're fairly young this year. They, I think the most experienced team returning in the GAC is, is Roger State. Most of the rest of us have quite a few. I mean, nor, um, Fort Hayes, I think, had 17 new players. We have 16 new players. Uh, I believe Northeastern is quite a few as well from going through their roster. I haven't added them up yet. But So it's a very young conference this year. So it's... It, it's not like we can look at the game, games last year and really get a good idea. Sure. We, we have to look at the games they've played this year. And they, from what I've looked at yesterday, I think they've only managed to get one game in so far. So. Yeah, though they might be a little bit rusty. So kind of unknown what kind of a team that the Jets will see on Saturday. Once again, at Northeastern State in Tahlequah. And that is a Great American Conference match, 2 o'clock for the kickoff on Saturday, March 13th. Coach, have a safe trip down and best of luck against the Hawks coming up on Saturday. Thank you very much. We've got more of the JetCast coming up. We will continue our trip around the world. This time we're going to South America with a guy that he calls Nacho, Ignacio Larich, one of the leading scorers on this. Newman men's soccer team. He's coming up next on the JetCast.
Newman Jets soccer team getting set for action. As you watch this, they'll actually be in the middle of a friendly this week playing one of the FC Wichita teams. They return to action in the Great American Conference on Saturday at Tahlequah, taking on the Riverhawks of Northeastern State, 2 o'clock for the kickoff of that one Saturday at Northeastern State. Joining me now, a junior forward all the way from Argentina, one of the leading scorers on this Newman men's soccer team, Ignacio Larich. Thanks so much for being on the show, Ignacio. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Well, you guys had a, a really important win last time out. Probably, I, I mean, I would guess it's your best performance of the year against Harding, a 5-1 victory for you on Thursday last week. How good did it feel after back-to-back -back losses to get back in the win column and, and play the way that you guys did with good defense and one of your best scoring days of the season? No, it was actually very good, especially for the new guys, you know, like the freshmen who started getting motivated more for the next game coming for the season, you know. Uh, after two losses that we have in the, the first two games, it was tough. We had, like, our, who were rope like, <laughs> in the neck, you know, like we had to win for sure, and then we won. Uh, and I think that the team started going like progressively going up in terms of the playing of how it's the system in the system of playing. You know? Obviously, whenever you lose, you know it always feels like it's the worst thing that's ever happened. Yeah. How do you keep yourself positive? Because on the one hand, obviously every match is important. You want to win every match. You get. You, you know, a lot of guys hate losing, but at the same time, how do you balance that? Because at the same time, it is just one match, and there are there is still a lot of season left. So, how do you balance that personally for yourself? Yeah, so that's obviously talking. You know, like everyone talking is like, oh, "Come on, let's 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 go, let's wake up, let's we need to win." And also, like the coaching staff, like help a lot of that. You know, like let's go, like it's just a game. We will like we move on. Like let's move on. Let's correct the mistake that we did in the past, so we don't make the same mistake in the future, you know? In the previous two matches, defense, uh, Roger State, that was a, a really close match. But you guys gave up four goals against Fort Hayes State the previous match, but only one against Harding. What do you feel allowed you to make the defensive improvements to get that win last time out on Thursday? Yeah, honestly, I wouldn't talk about just the defense. You know, I think that it's like collectively defense, you know. It's just like, it's not like just like the four players that play on the back. It's everyone, you know, like everyone put like a little bit of himself to defend and we all mess it up, honestly. Like we all play our bad, bad game and it was a collectively bad performance, you know. I wouldn't blame the defense, you know. I, mean, I didn't score, uh, someone else didn't do like his job good and like everyone wasn't in the same level, you know. So you have been one of the leading shot takers on the team last year and coming into this year. But this year, not that you weren't finding the net enough last year, but you are really finding the net this year. You've got, you know, the majority of the team's points, majority of the team's shots. What do you feel like has been the key to your offensive success this season? Well, honestly, uh, I, as I said, I think it's a team performance. You know, I wouldn't, like, just, like, put all my like, credit to myself. You know, I train as hard as I can. I practice individually by myself too, in order to improve. But it's a collective performance, you know. I wouldn't be able to do it by myself, you know. It's not just Nacho beating Harding, you know. It's Newman beating Harding. And when we win, we win together. When we lose, we lose together. And as I said, I think that the team is doing great. We are progressing, like, our performance is getting better every game. Uh, we start getting the system, you know. So I'm, I'm glad that I've had the possibility to score, to score and to be here with you now. Uh, Otherwise, you wouldn't have him by me, be honest. <laughs> yeah, it's be honest, else. you know, like, be honest. <laughs> but mean, we, we, we do pay attention to the guys who put the ball in the net, right? <laughs> Just like in baseball, they say the chicks dig the long ball. We, we, we get that. Now, you, you're from Argentina, so you traveled a long way to come play soccer here in Wichita, Kansas. What allowed you to get here to the States originally? I know that you're a transfer from North Carolina Wesleyan originally. How did you make the decision that you wanted to come pursue your education and pursue your soccer? career collegiately here in America rather than staying in Argentina or going somewhere in South America? Well, in Argentina, the system is super diff different than here, you know, like this super, super difficult to study at the same time that you play because the systems are not together and it's not like here, you know, it's not like a school that provides you both. It, either you play soccer or you study. There's no like way to put both together, you know. Interesting. So... That's why like, I, I started studying in Argentina. I was doing international business. 
and at some point I couldn't like I couldn't continue you know I was either like keep playing soccer my mom let me play soccer for one more year I was training with the pros I didn't make it so my mom said wake up and <laughs> <laughs> start studying you know like you need to follow your career keep playing soccer as well but you need to have a degree in case that something happened you know injuries or whatever you know sure yeah but better figure out something else to do yeah. as well do you feel like there is a difference in style obviously if you're a sports fan you know from watching if you are a soccer fan you know from watching the world cup the guys that wear the uh i believe it's the pale blue and the white striped shirt uh, jerseys with the black shorts it, it, it's a soccer insane nation argentina um is there a difference in the playing style between collegiate in America and what you saw trying to come up in the pro system in Argentina? Well, you know, like Argentina is a place where everyone plays soccer. You know, it's like we'd be like the comparison would be like basketball here. You know, people sure. is playing the street, people is playing everywhere. You see soccer everywhere around the, the country. You know, uh, I think that soccer here is growing a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, it's getting better. Every year I see like more investment in the MLS, even the low divisions, you know, like it's getting better and better. I think that this here is more aggressive and more like running style, you know, like more physical style. Uh, and in Argentina it's a different like style. I think it's not better, it's not worse, it's just it's different. Sure. Uh, but yeah, I think that that's the, the, the difference that I can find. Being here in this time, Obviously, is much different than any other time, probably in the history of Newman athletics, even going back to when it was Kansas Newman College, just because of the pandemic that's going on right now. And I always ask the foreign students and student athletes that are on this show, because you were here last year, obviously things were normal. You come up to March, and obviously things became very not normal in 2020. How did you cope with that, and how is your family doing in Argentina with everything else going on in the world right now? Well, it was complicated. It was complicated. Me, I got stuck here. I couldn't go back to Argentina, so mm. I'd be here the whole summer. I mean, actually, like, I want to like say thank you to the school and to the coach because they helped me a lot in the process of being here by myself. Uh, it was it was complicated. You know? It was it was hard. I was completely completely by myself here at school. It wasn't <laughs> no one here. You know, right. it was me and Turner, no one else. <laughs> uh, but I mean, you need to stay like mentally strong. I was FaceTiming with my family almost every day. They actually they had the virus, and so I was even more worried about that. Sure. And they w they've been locked down for more than a year, and they they couldn't even go out. They are actually still in lockdown. So it was a complicated situation. You know, like. Have you been able to go back and see them since? Yeah, I went back now uh, in the for the winter break. Okay, uh, excellent. Yeah, finally I saw them. I was it was nice, you know. Like. <laughs> I bet. I <laughs> but, bet. But yeah, it was complicated. You know, it was it wasn't it wasn't a good moment. You know. I don't know if you knew this, but nobody has been a coach at Newman University who's here currently longer than Coach Brown. What's it like to be coached by this guy? Nah, you? he's a great person. First of all, he's a great person. You know, I think that in priorities, you know, he is a great person. Then a great coach. I'm super thankful for him, like giving me the opportunity to be here. You know, I wouldn't be here if it's not for him. And I guess I heard that he. Like the the person who has the record is like in four for like four years, you know, like in the whole history of the NCAA. Uh, so I hopefully he can break that record, you know, and pass that. Well, it sounds good. <laughs> that that's, that sounds like a plan to me. Like I said earlier on, when you first started playing here, you were at North Carolina Wesleyan. What's the adjustment been like, North Carolina Wesleyan, an NAI program? What's the difference been for you to try to make that adjustment? coming from North Carolina Wesleyan at the NAI level to the Division II level playing in the Great American Conference here at Newman? Yeah, it was, as I said, I like to practice by myself. I think that I, I think I have a lot of things to improve. And when I was in North Carolina, I was trying to see what things, adjustment I can do to my game in order like to go to the next level, you know? And then I played only one season there in, in North Carolina. It was good. It was a good experience. I made a lot of good friends. And then when I said, okay, let's st step up and let's try to challenge myself for, for a different level, uh, that's how I end up here at Newman. Um, I think it was a great decision, honestly. I hear, especially the, the first year that I came, my sophomore year, we had a great team and we went to a semifinal. And it was a great experience on all 
years long here at Newman. You've talked a lot about trying to improve your own game. And soccer is a, an interesting sport in that, you know, there, there is a lot of individual drilling from talking to coach, talking to the women's coach and other players. There is a lot of individual drilling that you can do. But at the same time, you know, there's a lot of other guys out there on the field with you that you do have to work with. How much can you get better on your own? And how much do you have to work together as a team to try to become better as a unit? And which is more important, do you think, for developing the team and getting to where you guys want to go and, and reaching some team goals this year? Yeah, so for me, collectively, it's a, the, like the main thing, the main priority. Right? With that being said, I think that if, you, if each player individually is the best in his position and he, I can achieve the best of his performance, Obviously, that will help the collectively, you know, like sure. how you achieve that. I mean, that's pretty obvious, you know, eating good, eating healthy, sleeping good, don't going for party, <laughs> training by yourself, like as much as you like can do, you know, like it's a lot of things that you can do by yourself. And you can't have the coach telling you all the time, like you have to eat good, you have to sleep good. Like, those are things that if you're an athlete, you have to do, you know. What do you feel like you have improved the most in your game? since you got here to the United States? And what's something that you feel like you would like to improve even more going through your junior year right now and to your senior year next year? Obviously, soccer does get a give back here because no championships nationally for soccer. Those got canceled by the NCAA. They've got the Great American Championship coming up later on this spring. Um, so you'll possibly have a couple more years, but, you know, not getting into that. What is the one thing that you feel like you've improved the most? And what's the one thing that you feel like you want to improve the most as you move forward in your soccer career? The thing I improved the most, I think, is my finishing. I, I wasn't, when I was in Argentina, I was more like an individual player that make a good play and assist someone else, but I wasn't like a score player. You know? Gotcha. I hear, like, because of facilities and everything, I could, like, practice more and improve my, 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 my finishing, you know. Uh, I proved a little bit more my physical, too. I wasn't that, like, I mean, I'm not big, you know. I'm a normal <laughs> person, you know. But <laughs> but I, like, became, like, a little more, like, muscular, you know, like, sure. to, in order to play in this level, you know. And as I said, like, it's more physical, and I, I really need it. And... I, I don't know. I have a lot of things to improve on. I I, I would I wouldn't say one. I, I I have multiple things probably in my head. My like heading. I have to improve a lot. A couple of parts of the game. But I think I have to improve a lot. Last question for you. Northeastern State coming up for you guys. Obviously the friendly today. Uh, probably going to be mostly for reserve guys who don't play as much so you're probably not going to be seeing as much action at, at you know today against fc wichita as the fans watch and listen to this but northeastern state back to great american conference play on saturday what do you need to see out of the team on the road to try to make this into a two-game winning streak well i think that we have to do the same thing that we did last game you know like we can't do the same mistake that we did in the first two games that's for sure we still have the rope in our neck, so we have to win for <laughs> sure. And yeah, so I think that Nacho is not going to win. Uh, the other four is not going to win. We are all going to win, and we all collectively will win, or we all collectively will lose. You know, so we need from everyone's performance in order to take this game that we really need it, you know. Northeastern State, Tahlequah, Oklahoma, and the match is on Saturday, March 13th at Northeastern State. The Jets and the Riverhawks as the Jets get back into GAC play in the Great American Conference. Ignacio Larich Jr. from Argentina, a forward on this Newman men's soccer team. Thanks so much, Ignacio. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. When we wrap up the show, we will be talking with a women's tennis player, Emily Young, all the way from England. That's when we come back on the JetCast. Hi friends, Phil Nightingale, General Manager at Mount Hamilton Ford. Have you been thinking about a new SUV? Right now is a great time to buy a new Ford at the big one of 119th in West Kellogg. EcoSport, Escape, Edge, Explore, Expedition, Mount Hamilton Ford is sure to have the right vehicle to fit your size. And you know you can count on us with this great selection to find the right SUV at the best price to fit your budget. Check us out online or in person. Let us make your purchase easy with pickup and delivery right from your home or work. Mount Hamilton Ford, experience the difference.
wrapping up the JetCast as we talk women's tennis. Women's tennis is back underway, and we're here with a senior from Holmfirth, England. Emily Young playing singles and doubles for the Jets this year. Emily, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Well, uh, last time out over uh, William Jewell and Doan, a sweep for you in doubles. So fantastic job by you with your partner, Marella D'Angelo Cavalcanti. Sorry if I messed your name up. Uh, Marella, uh, but uh, how do you feel like you guys did as a tandem against William Jewell and Doan University? We did well, yeah. It was um, the teams, they weren't as strong as they normally are because they had a few girls that are like stuck in their country. Sure. But yeah, no, we performed well. We, um, yeah, we were focused and. Yeah, we just got the win. We did what we needed to do. What do you, how do you feel about uh, being a partner with Morella this year? And how do you guys get along on and off the court? Yeah, no, we live together as well. So okay. we do get on really well. That was the... Um, I normally play with um, Antonia. Okay. Who's a freshman. But, um, yeah, we mixed it up for that match. And, um, no, it worked well together. It was nice to play with her because... We got on really well off the court, so on the court it was good as well. Uh, do, you, do you feel like that's something that might continue into the future? I hope so. Yeah, I enjoy playing with her. I guess yeah. it's uh, up to up to coach uh, up to coach. So we'll see what she yeah. thinks about everything. Uh, you actually got to play at number one singles as well last time out, and you picked up a yeah. victory. How much number one singles do you normally play, and how would you rate your performance in that win? Um, so this semester I've played at one every time, so I'm enjoying playing there. It's a, a more of a challenge than what I have done in the past. I've normally played like number three or four. Gotcha. And um, yeah, no, it's been good. I like playing there and um, I feel like the teams obviously weren't as strong this weekend, but it's still good. It was our first time playing outside and it was uh, like a good introduction match to the the outside. The women's tennis team is taking on Evangel University in Springfield, Missouri coming up on Friday and then they've got MIAA play coming up later this month. You mentioned that this is the first time that you've really gotten to play number one singles on a consistent basis throughout yeah. one semester. How much more mental pressure is that? Is there doing that? Obviously most of the time, not that it's going to be the case for every school, but typically number one means that you're the top player, so the level of top competition is going to be a little bit higher. And I'm guessing that the mental pressure may be a little bit diff uh, a little bit different, just being that number one player. How have you kind of dealt with that, and how do you feel like mentally you have adjusted to being number one versus number three or four? Um, I've just kind of embraced it, really, like the – there might be a bit more pressure, but at the same time, I've got nothing to lose. Like everyone, everyone's just going to go out there and do the best, no matter where they play. So that's kind of how I think about it, and I just give my all. So well, I've talked to a lot of of players up here, and there are some that feel like they're more of a singles player, more of a doubles player, and certainly at the professional level, mm. most players. Not not true for everybody. Obviously, there's always you know. Players like Serena around that can pretty much play whatever they want. Yeah. <laughs> but um, a lot, most players seem to specialize either singles or doubles. But there are a couple that that do play both. Do you feel like you're more of a of a natural singles player or doubles player? And what do you feel like is the biggest difference between those two disciplines? Um, I really enjoy doubles. Like I've learned to enjoy singles more. It's, they are quite, they're very different obviously sure. because tennis has always been such an individual sport and then you come out here and you also have to do like the team part together and then also the doubles part which not not everyone's used to. I, I was lucky to play like a lot of doubles when I was younger as well so I've always been like comfortable doing both but it is like it's so different having to like connect with a partner and then yeah, just knowing the way they play and what they're going to do next. Like, you're not just, it's different from being in control yourself to changing it to having to, like, not rely on someone else, but just work with that other person and trust in them. Now, obviously, being from England, 
and really tennis is pretty big throughout the United Kingdom, but England especially, you guys are crazy about tennis. How did you get into tennis originally when you were growing up there in grade school? Or was it a, or was it a thing where you got into it maybe later than most? No, I think I started when I was like six, so yeah, I did start when I was young. Sure. Um, my mum played tennis, and yeah, I have like, there's quite a big like club down, just down the road from me, like a high performance centre, and yeah, I just started and got picked up by them and then just went through their like, their different levels of coaching and yeah, I've just always loved it. Was there, was there a particular tennis player that you feel like you've you've tried to model your game after or one player that you've really enjoyed following his or her career as you've come up yourself as a tennis player? Um, well, the obvious one's like Andy Murray. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Um, I've always liked him, but... Um, yeah, no, he's the only one, really. The, 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 I mean, you, you, if you're the first... British man to win Wimbledon in 50 years or something. Yeah, no, it was huge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I don't think that, that fans here in America can really understand just because tennis has fallen so far in popularity here. Yeah. Um, mainly because, I mean, we, we haven't had any dominant men's players since, what, like the 90s or whatever. But yeah. I don't think people really understand how big of a deal that was for you guys being such a, t a tennis crazy nation. What was it like for yeah. you to watch him win those two Wimbledon titles? And obviously it started with a, a gold medal and he won a U.S. Open as well. Yeah, no, it was so exciting and like the buzz like around the tennis like scene was big with him winning that. And yeah, no, he's just, I know he seems a bit grumpy, but like, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was nice to just see him to finally, because I feel like he deserves it, even though he is quite grumpy, like everyone does. They like him, even though he might not be the most likable person. Sure. Well, yeah. I mean, he's certainly, if not for the other his competition, I think he probably would have won a lot more. Yeah. Um, you, coronavirus obviously has affected everything in terms of athletics. Here, uh, you know, the United States is still dealing with it. No, the United Kingdom is still mm -hmm. trying to come to grips with it. Uh, were you able to be in contact with your family? Did, were you able to go home when the pandemic hit? How did that affect you and your family back home in England? So when it first happened, uh, was it around March? I think it was. You're, it, it was, what day is it today? As we record, yeah. so as people watch this, it's March 10th. So it is exactly two days from now when everything got shut down on March 12th. Oh my gosh. From last year, if you can believe that, we're that close to being one year since this you know nightmare started. That's crazy. Yeah, um, I know. Yeah, so when it first hit, I decided to go home. And then, obviously, England was in, like, a really strict lockdown compared to here. They still are now. Um, and then I wasn't sure if I'd be able to come back with, like, the the borders closing and everything. But sure. I got here in, like, August time. But I, I didn't go home at Christmas because there's, like, so many unknowns still. I didn't know if I'd be able to get back. But right. I mean, I think I could have gone home, but everything was shut in England, so I'd have just been in my house. Right. So, yeah, it's a lot. My dad was like, if you, there's had nothing to, be, to do. So. That, that had to be pretty tough. Yeah, no, it was tough to not see them, especially at a time like Christmas, like a family time. But, yeah, I went to my friend in Oklahoma, and she's they adopted me for the, oh, for the well, month. <laughs> that's very, Abby George also got adopted by uh, one of the players. She's from Australia. She got adopted yeah. for, for Christmas by one of, the, one of her teammates on the women's team. So that, that's been nice. So not being able to get home, has it been weird trying to follow? There's been a lot of, let's say, political happenings in the United K, uh, the United Kingdom here recently with pulling out of the EU and then the, the big, I mean, I'm sure you've know, heard something about the Royals interview with Oprah. Yeah, I uh, still need to watch it. I, I haven't watched that. I know nothing about it, but uh, um, w what's that been like for you as, you know, a, a, a native of the country trying to follow politics from afar, or at least the American slant on the coverage here in, in the United States? Yeah, well, I don't actually, I don't really watch the news here, but I do have, like, my, our, like, um, main news channel is BBC. Of course. And um, I have the app and everything, so I do read that most days and try and keep up, but, yeah. I did find that interview because I didn't actually know about the interview. Um, sure. My teammate's mum told me, and she's like, "Oh my gosh, can you believe the interview that's <laughs> about to happen?" And I was like, "Oh, I don't know what's going on." And well, then she told me, and 
Yeah, it so, sounds like it was quite. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure it'll be of great, great interest to you. I haven't yeah. seen it, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm guessing it's 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 all over the news. So I'm, yeah. I'm sure you're you're going to have thoughts on that. We'll just leave yeah. it at that. Evangel University coming up in, in Springfield, Missouri on Friday. What are you expecting to see in in those matches coming up in Missouri uh, against Evangel? Um, I haven't. I don't think we've played them in by the when. The time that I've been here, I don't think we've played think, them before. Yeah, I think that's right. So um, it'll be interesting to see what sort of players they have. But everything's so different this time. Like sure. You never know what you're going to come up against. But, yeah, we'll just have to go in and give it our best. Last question for you. What are you working on in your game to get ready? Because MIAA play is coming up. All These are all non-conference action. No conference matches yet for Newman. But MIAA play is coming. And we've heard from your coach about how difficult the MIAA is, how good they are in women's tennis, mm. and MIAA play is starting later this month. What do you feel like you need to fine-tune to get ready for association play coming up later in March? Yeah, it's going to be a lot tougher, so I just need to focus on um, making sure my body's really, like, ready for it and injury-free because I've like I've got a little injury, but I just need to manage it and maintain it and get through because... Yeah, I want to have my best last season. Absolutely. Emily Young, a senior from England on this women's tennis team. Once again, my double play is starting later this month. You can follow the schedules for all the teams, of course, at NewmanJets.com. But they're up next against Evangel University on the road in Springfield, Missouri on Friday. And you can follow along, NewmanJets.com. Emily, best of luck to you in Missouri. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. That is our show for this week. We'll be back next week, of course. All the episodes are posted on newmanjets.com slash podcasts. You can watch on YouTube. Some of you probably already are watching on YouTube. And if you can't watch on YouTube, just a note that you can always get it at newmanjets.com slash podcasts or on several of the major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple Podcast and Google Podcast. He's got a list of them up there. Uh, so Colin will take care of you. He'll get you to the right spot. Make sure you like and subscribe as well. That way you'll get the updates when we have all of these new shows for you. So we'll be back next week. We post these around 6 o'clock every Wednesday. So until then, Blake Cripps saying, Go Jets! Go Jets!